Hi everyone and welcome back to Advanced Heart Biology. Today we're going to continue with Unit 1, Cells and Proteins, and Kira for Communication and Signaling. It's been a little while since our last video, so hopefully you remember from Part 4b, we looked at hydrophobic signaling. And the main thing with hydrophobic signaling was how the hydrophobic molecules are able to move through the cell membrane and they are able to go across and bind directly to uh, intracellular receptors, so receptors inside the cell that we call transcription factors. And we had a look at the impact on the cell activity from that. Uh, today in 4C, we're going to look at hydrophilic signals. We're going to compare them with hydrophobic signals. Again, look at the impact and then look at a case study of this example as well. So let's get started. So to start off with, when we look at hydrophilic, hydrophilic signaling, sorry, um, the main difference here is that hydrophilic signaling molecules are not able to move just through the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, they have to bind to what we call transmembrane receptors. So they do not actually enter the intracellular space, the cytosol. They bind to a receptor, and that receptor is then going to have to pass the signal into the cell a slightly different way. When we look at some examples of these, any peptide hormone or neurotransmitters are examples of these hydrophilic, hydrophilic extracellular signaling molecules. And again, we're calling them extracellular because they are binding to receptors outside the cell membrane and sending a signal in. So again, just to kind of show you the process of this, in this diagram here, we have our cell membrane and on the right, we have this transmembrane receptor, which hopefully you remember from when we looked at the cell membrane. So the hydrophilic signaling molecule has then went and bound to the extracellular face of this receptor and like to what tends to happen with these receptors, we then have a change in conformation that's then going to perform some form of function. Now, again, like we said, this signal molecule does not physically enter the cell, but this signal is going to be passed across the cell membrane, and the term we're going to use this is transduced. So the signal that's being passed along is transduced from the receptor that has been activated, transduced across the plasma membrane. Now, when we talk about these uh, these extracellular proteins or these transmembrane receptors rather, these act as signal transducers because the signal is then being transduced across the cell membrane into the intracellular space. And by converting that ligand binding extracellular event, that's going to go into intracellular signals. And again, that's going to then alter the behavior of the cell. So a key point is just looking at hydrophobic versus hydrophilic signaling. How with hydrophobic, the signal just passes through. In hydrophilic, they have to bind to these signal transducers, these receptors, to pass that signal or transduce that signal across. Now, there's two forms of transduction, okay, the passing of the signal into the intracellular space. And these are going to involve something called G proteins or something called a cascade or a cascade of phosphorylation by a certain type of enzyme called kinase. So we're going to look at both of these one at a time. So first of all, for G proteins, G proteins are a protein that act as a sort of relay service between an activated receptor where the extracellular uh, hydrophilic signaling molecule has bound to the transmembrane receptor. The signal is then passed to a G protein that is then going to go across and pass that signal to a target protein. And that target protein could be an enzyme or it could be an ion channel, and it's going to lead to some form of activation. It might be the ion channel opening up, it might be the enzyme performing a certain function, but the idea being the G protein that in this diagram here we can see in green is just going to relay that message from the activated receptor to the target protein within the cell. When we talk about cascades, you may have heard the term cascade used when talking about things like uh, waterfalls, streams, this sort of thing. The idea of this sounds quite complicated, but all it is is a sort of knock-on pathway that's triggered by one event. So for in this case, we've got one kinase, and a phosphorylation takes place. That phosphorylation then activates the next kinase. Then that phosphorylation is going to activate the next kinase, and so on and so forth. And that cascade is just that pathway of knock-on events. Now what can happen as well is in that pathway, it might also activate more than one pathway um, in the intracellular space. So one activation of the kinase, one phosphorylation, could lead to more pathways being activated. And ultimately that might then lead to a phosphorylation of many other proteins. So that original signaling event, that message being passed across, 
may actually result in these cascades, which if you think of a cascade, it's going to be this, this build up, this spiral of all these little activations going on. Now, in terms of examples of this, what we tend to look at here in advanced higher is insulin. So you may remember insulin as a hormone. You may remember from National 5, we talk about how uh, insulin is responsible for converting that excess glucose in the blood uh, into stored glycogen. And that is all true. But what we look at in advanced higher is how does this take place rather than just this magical conversion that takes place. Now, um, insulin is a peptide hormone, so it's an example of a hydrophilic cyclic molecule. And like we've been saying, this binding of this, uh, this hormone, this insulin, to the face of that transmembrane receptor is then going to result in a signal being passed on. In this case, there's going to be a cascade, and that involves the recruitment of a transport protein, the vesicle, called GLUT4. And GLUT4 is responsible for transporting glucose molecules to the cell membrane of fat and muscle cells, where this is going to be stored and converted. So just to show you this through a diagram, and just again to go through this, what would happen is insulin would bind to its receptor. That receptor is then going to go through a conformational change, and that conformational change is then going to trigger phosphorylation of that receptor. Once that uh, phosphorylation takes place, there's then going to be a phosphorylation cascade in the intracellular space, which then, through these knock-on cascades, is going to lead to vesicles containing that GLUT4 being transported to the cell membrane. So the whole idea being is that insulin docking with the receptor leads to phosphorylation because of the change in conformation and the activation. And eventually you're then learning, you're triggering the GLUT4 to come across and pass across the um, vesicles that will transport the glucose across to the cell membrane of fat and muscle cells. Now, the last part of this sub-key area, we actually look at diabetes, because again, you may remember, we talk about the impact of insulin on your blood glucose levels, and in National 5, you probably discussed diabetes and how it was caused. In advance, I would just do a little bit more detail, talking about type 1 and type 2 diabetes, which you may be aware of already. So essentially, type 1 diabetes is caused by the failure to produce insulin. So therefore, if you don't have that insulin, then you aren't going to be able to trigger that uh, receptor. You aren't going to trigger the GLUT4 receptors to actually go and move this glucose and go and get it converted and stored. Um, so that's the main issue with type 1, and that's why you'd have to give yourself insulin, either by injection or other means, to actually have this process work. Uh, type 2, which, again, you may have heard of, isn't actually anything to do with your insulin. You may have plenty of insulin, no issues with your insulin whatsoever, but you actually have a loss of the receptor function. So again, even if you have all the insulin going, if that receptor doesn't work, then you're not going to have that phosphorylation cascade, GLUT4 is not going to be triggered. Now type two is generally associated with obesity. And one of the things we talk about in terms of both prevention and um, helping you with, with uh, type two is exercise. Part of this is because exercise is also able to trigger recruitment of GLUT4. So again, if you have more GLUT4, if you have more of the vesicles containing GLUT4, then you can also improve the uptake of that glucose to the fat and muscle cells. And that's going to help with your type 2 diabetes. So finally, this table just summarizes these parts. This sometimes comes up as a multiple choice question. And it's just good for you to know the causes of type 1 and type 2, the differences between them, and how you could potentially treat this as well. The main part being, with type 1, you need insulin, so you can inject yourself with insulin. With type 2, there's an issue with the receptors not responding to insulin, and therefore, through a controlled diet and exercise, you could use the, or you build up more of the GLUT4 recruitment as well. So just make sure you're aware of both of those. So that's it for uh, this sub-key area. Uh, we only have one more sub-key area to go, which is uh, part D. Um, in this case, though, with nerve impulse transmissions, I'm going to split this up into a fuller two, um, just to make it a bit more confusing. So apologies for that. It's because there's quite a lot of information. Uh, this part, uh, part D, part one, will deal with uh, nerve impulses, neurons, synapses, all that side of stuff. Um, and again, it's a process that's not too hard to learn, but quite a lot of information. And then the final part then looks at the eye and how the eye works, different cells, and uh, all the 
all the processes that are triggered within the eye in terms of nerve impulses. So again, thank you very much for listening to us, folks. I know it's been a while. I do appreciate you getting in touch. Um, and apologies for the delay in getting these out. Uh, we'll try and speed this up because I know a lot of you uh, find this quite useful for your vision. So hopefully you find this video useful and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much. Bye for now.